Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why it's dark. No, that doesn't do it. Well, she's in the front, so we got light radiating yeah. now, so we're good. Okay, so glycogen. So here's a picture just showing the alpha 4 1 linkages here. Okay, but then you can see the cross branches, and so that means alpha 1 6. Okay, okay cellulose. So it's cellulose is another polysaccharide, and its main function is for structural support. Cellulose, remember, is linked together by beta 1, 4 linkages. So one's upright, the next one's upside down, upright, upside down. We have enzymes that do not recognize that linkage, so we can't break down cellulose. So these fibers are considered tough. It's made up, it's found in plant cells, and it gives that plant support to grow upright. Um, and like I said, a few animals at the bottom there can break it down. Um, others, they need the help from bacteria as well as some protists to break it down. I'll push your mic up so actually hear me. So cellulose, beta-1,4, structural support, basically. So here's a picture showing cellulose zoomed in on a plant, and then we kind of see those beta linkages. So here's the plant. Cellulose is found in the cell walls. You can see the cellulose kind of crisscrossing. We pull out one of those fibers. It's made up of tiny uh, cellulose molecules. But you can see it's upright. There's that CH2OH up here, but then it's down here, and then it's upright and down. So beta-1,4 linkages. So just a nice summary of your starch showing that CH2OH group upright. Here, up, down, up, down. Here's glycogen. These are what kind of linkages? Or they're straight across? Alpha-1,4. And then these are? Yep, beta 1, 6. What? I mean, I meant alpha 1, 6. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so now we have chitin. Uh, this is the last polysaccharide that we'll cover, and then we'll jump into the plate acids. So chitin is found in um, arthropods and fungi. So fungi, they don't have cell walls. They have a cell wall made of chitin, not cellulose. Um, Orthopods are like insects, crustaceans. It's very similar to cellulose, but it's modified in that they have an N-acetyl group instead of a hydroxyl group. So a hydroxyl group is an OH group. We took a functional um, group quiz yesterday on that. So an N-acetyl group instead of a hydroxyl group in each glucose. And um, again, one's upright, one's upside down. So just flip-flops. And as a result, you get very tough, resistant material. I'm so sorry, it's so touchy. Very tough, resistant surface material. And like I said, it's found in the ex exoskeleton of insects and crustaceans. I uh, harvested my pumpkin patch this past weekend, and a lot of them had kind of like warts on them, like they were just bumpy. And so I looked it up, and um, it was, it, it's caused by a mosaic virus, but it's spread by aphids, and the aphids were terrible this year. So I like looked up, how do you get rid of aphids safely in a pumpkin patch? And they're like, oh, um, you just take down dish soap and mix it with water, and it's like a certain proportion, and you just spray your pumpkins like twice a week until the aphids are gone. And it's because like the soap actually breaks down their exoskeleton. So it's like, cool. So I'm gonna get them next. 
next year. So, just a nice summary of the four that we just talked about. Okay, review question. Why are carbohydrates an important molecule for energy storage? It is A, the carbon-hydrogen bonds store energy. Next one, plant cells store energy in the form of blank, and animal cells store energy in the form of blank. D, starch in plants, glycogen in animals. Another one for you. What makes cellulose different from starch? D. D. All right, let's walk through the starch is produced by plant cells, cellulose is produced by animal cells, so it's not D, because that's false. We don't make cellulose, right? So A and D are gone. Cellulose forms long filaments and starch is highly branched. True or false? True. Starch is insoluble, cellulose is soluble. I don't know if we talked about the solubility of cellulose, but cellulose is not uh, soluble, because if it was, then plants would melt every time it rained. So... B. Okay, so we uh, went through simple sugars and talked about the four big polysaccharides and how they function. So remember, different colored backgrounds means that I'm just going to throw up some extra information out for you. And we've kind of discussed this idea with the idea of uh, spontaneous generation, like where did life start? It obviously had to start with um, like a non-living thing and then make the jump to, so go from chemical to biological, right? You guys remember that hypothesis at all? Okay. So the vast majority of biologists believe that life began as a polymer called nucleic acid, in this case, RNA. And I know we've talked briefly about RNA in biology. It's very similar to DNA, but there are some differences. Like the nucleotides are different. All unicorns can giggle. They have a uracil instead of a thymine. They're single strand, not double strand, like in DNA. So I'm going to talk about the RNA world hypothesis. So, what is life? I'm teaching this to my biology kids right now. It's characteristics of life. One of them is that you have to be able to reproduce. Okay, so you have to be able to re reproduce and copy yourself to pass on traits to keep your species or lineage going. You also have to uh, acquire particular molecules and go through metabolism. And then the yeah, key idea, key idea. Oh my gosh, idea here. <laughs> Um, is that life started with replication and then somehow became cellular. So I'm going to focus in on this RNA molecule. So this is the world hypothesis, RNA world hypothesis in a nutshell. RNA can self-replicate, okay? Um, it is far simpler than DNA because it's a single strand. Um, and it can go in any direction. RNA can become DNA and it can become Proteins. Now, I know when we say DNA is the universal genetic code that's found in all organisms, but maybe when life started, maybe it was started with RNA. So here's contemporary biology today. We call this the central DNA dogma, where DNA goes through transcription to become RNA, and then RNA gets translated to a protein, and DNA can replicate. But in the RNA world biology, RNA can replicate, how viruses do this, but they do have the ability to become DNA and to go back through a process called reverse transcriptase, and they can become proteins, whereas DNA cannot do that. So um, there's lots of evidence that maybe life started with RNA and then made to the jump to DNA, which is a little bit more stable. Now comets have delivered a lot of organic compounds, and maybe it helped form some of those abiotic reactions that occur in space. We have found amino acids. In meteorites, and remember, amino acids are building blocks for proteins. I know we haven't really gotten to amino acids yet, but if you do remember from biology, you have 20 different amino acids, you arrange them in a certain sequence, and you can form a protein. So it's possible that we could have gotten some building material from space. Also, possible locations where conditions could have allowed for the synthesis of these organic compounds needed to build cells and life. Um, deep sea thermal vents on the bottom of the ocean floor. We have found some strange life forms there. Not only that, the, the, the fumes that come out um, are used to make sugars. In space, I just said amino acids have been found in dust, which is kind of cool. Volcanoes, okay. 
um, tidal pools have uh, the clay for some reason tends to be a catalyst to build minerals as well as some other molecules and we will come back to this this idea later on this semester so anyways nucleic acids what I want to talk about is their structure compare and contrast DNA RNA the functions of DNA and RNA and then just recognize that nucleotides are not just used for information storage they can be used for energy metabolism so here we go with nucleic acids So any type of chemical reaction inside of us is usually carried out by an enzyme or a protein, and that protein has a specific sequence. We know that in cells, information is passed on to the next generation, even though protein molecules themselves are not, because if a protein kind of reaches the end of its lifespan, it gets like recycled. But proteins of that kind are continuously made. And that's because DNA carries the recipe or the code for them. So cells use RNA to read the cell's DNA encoded information. So RNA acts like this intermediate mole molecule between the DNA and the protein. So let's take a look at the structure of a nucleic acid. It's made up of three parts made up of a nitrogen base, okay, in green here. So a nitrogen base, it's either, this is what makes it adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, or uracil. It's made up of a phosphate group, which is also a functional group that we quizzed on yesterday. And then we also have a sugar. Now the sugar is different between RNA and DNA. In RNA, the sugar is a ribose. In DNA, it is a deoxyribose because it's missing an oxygen. So deoxy means you've taken an oxygen off. So the sugar and the phosphate are the same for every single nucleotide, like in DNA or if you're looking at RNA. And the thing that makes it different is that nitrogen base. So then you can see here that the phosphate group is linked to the sugar and the sugar is linked to the nitrogen. All right, side-by-side -side comparison oh, geez, of RNA and DNA. So RNA is a single-stranded molecule. Okay. It has a sugar phosphate backbone, just like DNA. Sugars are different, and the bases are different. Here we have a uracil, and over here we have a thymine. DNA is a double helix, but we still have that sugar phosphate backbone. or the components that make it up, yeah. phosphate group, and the nitrogen base. So these are nucleotides, and if you get a bunch of nucleotides together, then you're going to form um, a, a, poly a polymer, po yeah, a polymer, a very large molecule, a macromolecule, which is, in this case, um, a nucleic acid. So how does the polymer form? It forms when a phosphate group from a nucleotide binds to an OH group from the sugar of another. And it's always linked in a five to three direction. So when we form bonds, we release water. We talked about dehydration, condensation reactions, how they form bonds. We talked about that yesterday. So we're going to form a phosphodiester bond that links the two nucleotides together. This phosphodiester bond is found in the sugar phosphate group. DNA and RNA are directional. And like I said, the bond always forms um, between the three carbon and the five carbon. So it does have directionality. And it's always five to three. They grow in a five to three direction. So here's my five carbon. Here's my three carbon. So it always grow, grows from five to three, five to three. So if I wanted to add another nucleotide, I would not go here. I would go here, down at the bottom of these three. So DNA and RNA grow five to three. 
this will come back this semester. Like, we'll talk about how DNA replicates, we'll talk about transcription. Five to three. Five to three. Now, nucleotides actually come in two forms. Okay, there are two types of nitrogen bases. Now, I know I said there's five different nucleotides, right? Cytosine, uracil, thymine, adenine, and guanine. But the nitrogen bases themselves can come in two forms. A single ring called the pyrimidine or a double ring called the purine. So the nitrogen bases that belong in the pyrimidine category, just a single ring, are cytosine, uracil, and thymine. These are all single rings. Wait, so what are you thinking? Pyrimidine and purine. Oh. Oh, sorry, I guess I should forgot to click. So purines, uh, I was talking about pyrimidines first. So pyrimidines are the single ring, C U T. Now the double rings, are called purines, and only adenine and guanine fit the bill for that. So one way to help you remember which nucleotide bases are purines, well, it's A and G, right? So, I know this is terrible, but you can say angels and gods are pure. Purine. Add that to your list of mnemonic devices, right? Oil rig. So I'm going to give your hands a little break here. Go back to my RNA world hypothesis. So during this chemical evolution part, our nucleotides probably formed on clay-sized mineral particles. Remember I showed you that picture of the tidal pool where clay act as a catalyst. Catalyst means they start chemical reactions. So what they decided to do, um, this will say researchers, researchers took ribonucleotides, which are just basically nucleotides, A's and G's and C's, like they're not bonded to each other, and they just stuck it in with some clay. And every day for 14 days, they just kept adding nucleotides and analyzed the clay particles. And by the end of it, they found RNA molecules that were up to 40 nucleotides long. So all they did was just add these nucleotides to the clay, and it didn't do anything else to it. And they were like making these chemical reactions occur. They were forming phosphodiester bonds. So um, here's a snippet from their actual study. So it says, outline two properties of RNA that would have allowed it to play a role in the origin of life. Number one, RNA can self-replicate. So it says, short polymers of ribonucleotides can be synthesized abiotically in a laboratory. So not from living things, just from non-living. If these polymers are added to a solution of ribonucleotide monomers, sequences up to 10 base long are copied from the template according to the base pairing rules. Whereas um, A pairs with T and, well, there's no T in your RNA, so A pairs with U and C and G pair together. If zinc is added, the copy sequences may reach 40 nucleotides with less than a 1% error. So here are my RNA monomers, monomers, and they just threw them on, took some clay, and they started to form short little RNA polymers. Um, and then they actually started to notice that sometimes they would form double bonds for the, the double helix structure. Okay, so could chemical evolution result in the production of these nucleotides? It's like, so how do we get to the building blocks of these polymers? So no one has actually observed the formation of a nucleotide through chemical evolution. There is a problem with the sugar, making that sugar the, the ribose and the nitrogen-based components, but they have done simulations that have shown that sugars can be made um, that mimic the prebiotic soup. So 
I don't know if we talked about the Yuri Miller experiment in biology, but there were two scientists in California sorry, um, that mimicked early earth conditions. So they set up this giant apparatus, and here they added water, okay, and then they had a flame to mimic like Earth's volcanic activity that heats up water. And then the water um, would evaporate. So not only that, we have the sun. So evaporation does occur. So water evaporates. And then they had a stopcock that would put in, stopcock's just like a switch that opens and closes a valve. But they would put in um, methane, ammonia, hydrogen gas, and any other gases that were found in early Earth's conditions. And then when they got all mixed together, um, they would have this spark that would literally just go across right here. And the spark would actually cause the molecules to collide and form chemical reactions. And then if we remember from our water cycle, water condenses and it rains back to the earth. And that's how our oceans formed. So they did this experiment for, I don't know, a period of time. And at the end of it, they analyzed the water and they found all of these products in this prebiotic soup. So they found carboxylic acids, like formic acid, acylic acid, or, sorry, acidic acid, propanoic, lactic acid. Um, they found nucleotide bases like adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil. They found sugars that were straight and branched, specifically pentose, which means they had five carbons, and hexoses, which had six. They found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven amino acids. So they actually created all of this from nothing, really. I mean, just like from abiotic factors. So another diagram just showing um, the boiling water, evaporation. The spark was to st uh, simulate uh, lightning because it does occur in the atmosphere and can cause chemical reactions and the condensation and so on and so forth. However, there is one problem with the prebiotic soup, and that is the ribose problem, that sugar problem that I mentioned earlier. So if you take formaldehyde and you heat it, it forms almost all the sugars that have five or six. However, ribose is that dominant sugar for chemical evolution, and um, they do have problems forming it correctly, making it abundant, if you will. Um, also, the origin of the pyrimidines. Okay, so the pyrimidines are the single ring um, nucleotides. We, got, we had all the purines, but we were missing a primidine. I want to say it was thymine that we were missing. Um, so, yeah, there's a little hole in that theory as well. That's why it's still a hypothesis, not a theory, I guess. So, in brief summary, here's early Earth. We know clay existed. We know some of these early Earth molecules from an, um, analysis of rocks and ice. Um, and it's just saying that, you know, we've been able to make a lot of the macromolecules before life formed, basically. So, okay, enough of the RNA world hypothesis. Back to the function of DNA and RNA. So the function of DNA is that it carries information, aka the genetic code. The code uh, carries sequences for which amino acid links in order. You guys already know DNA is double helix. The bond that holds the double helix together is a hydrogen bond, and that it does match complementary. So A pairs with T, C pairs with G, that mnemonic device all tigers can growl. I think it was like two years ago, my kids, the kids came up with a mnemonic saying like something about like Tom Cruise and something else. I'm like, well, that doesn't really work because T and C don't bind together, but okay, whatever works for you. Bonds means hydrogen bonds. And we did discuss hydrogen bonds in chapter two. It's what gives water its unique properties.
let's focus in or talk about RNA here briefly. So RNA is a transcript of DNA. It's a short-lived molecule. It does have two major differences, and I'm sure you already know this because I've mentioned it already, but the ribose sugar instead of deoxyribose. And then uracil instead of thymine. Now these are the two major differences, but there are several more differences, right? Like the shape of it, single strand versus double strand. The job of it, um, DNA is a very stable molecule. Okay, it stays in the nucleus. RNA is a short-term molecule. It breaks down as soon as it leaves the nucleus. But it is a single-stranded molecule that helps specify the sequence of an amino acid to make that protein. So in this diagram here, we have DNA. And DNA will unzip in the process of transcription and we have an RNA polymerase that reads this and it matches complementary. And when it reaches the stop codon, it will, everything will fall off, DNA zips break back up. This mRNA molecule leaves the nucleus where it binds to a ribosome and then the ribosome reads it complementary, which codes for an amino acid. Yeah, so RNA viruses, what they do is, um, okay, so RNA polymerase is, is a terrible proofreader, so it mutates very quickly. So RNA can become DNA, so then that's what it does. It works backwards, but it makes a bunch of mistakes, and it mutates along the way. And then, um, but RNA will get into, like, it will make proteins. Those proteins hijack the cell, and that's how a virus gets inside of you. It hijacks the cell. It gets inside a cell and hijacks all of them machinery. But it starts with a genetic material, most of the time RNA. Okay, so one more side-by-side -side comparison. Single strand versus double strand. Bases are different, sugars are different. Long-term molecule versus short-term. So I'm pretty sure I'm on my on the, your exam there's a short answer that says and contrast DNA or RNA or tell me so many differences between the two. So, They are slightly different. So if we take a look at your cell here and we do a side-by-side -side comparison, you can see that this half is the same. So this looks the same, but notice it has an extra carbon H3 here. There's no carbon H3 here. All right, now the final thing is nucleotides, yes, they make up nucleic acids, but they are also huge components of uh, energy molecules. So last year we discussed ATP, adenine triphosphate, that's the energy molecule that we use. And if you notice, adenosine, well, it's got adenine in it. So adenine is a nucleotide that is found in an energy molecule. So ATPs are energy currency of cells. It drives unfavorable chemical reactions. We need it to power items across a membrane to move. Um, so yeah, another molecule or another nucleotide that's involved in the process of energy is NAD+. So if you remember my little like placemats last year where you guys had to move everything and you're like NAD+, becomes NADH, right? Yeah, I remember that's all coming back. Um, so NAD plus stands for um, nicotinamine adenine dinucleotide. So another molecule with adenine in it involved in the process of making energy. If you remember, NAD plus was an electron carrier. Now FAD was also an electron carrier, and you'll notice that it also has adenine in it. So, yeah. No, you don't need to memorize the names. I'm just pointing out that I'm, I'm just citing evidence that, yes, they are involved in energy.
sorry. Review question. So which carbohydrate would you find as part of a molecule of RNA? That's DNA. It's ribose. C. A molecule of DNA or RNA is a polymer of B, nucleotides. The double helix structure of a molecule of DNA is stabilized by what types of oh, D? Yep, hydrogen bonds. Very good. So I'm glad you guys did not say phosphodiester, okay? Because this question was double helix, so like connecting the two parts together is held by the hydrogen bonds. DNA does have phosphodiester bonds, but it's in the backbone part, or the rung of a ladder. So, yay. Which of the following is not a difference between DNA and RNA? Not a difference. It's D, phosphodiester versus hydrogen bonds. Very good. All right, so... We just wrapped up nucleic acids. I want to move on to proteins because proteins is kind of a big section. But we discussed the structure of the nucleotides. Oh, snap. Compared, contrast, DNA, RNA, their functions, and recognize that, yeah, they're involved in energy metabolism. Okay, proteins. So I'm going to talk about the four levels of protein structure. Um, I'm going to talk about what are motifs, how do they relate to domains, and how do these two contribute to the protein structure, and then finally understand that the 3D structure of a protein affects its job um, or its ultimate function, if you will. So here we go. What do proteins do? Proteins do a lot of things. Well, we can categorize it into seven categories for jobs or functions. And so the first one is an enzyme catalyst, which means it carries out a specific reaction. So I put the definition of an enzyme if you didn't know, but enzymes, they jumpstart reactions. They are not found in the reactant side or the product side of a chemical reaction. They kind of act like chaperones, if you will. They float around in solution. They have these active sites. They only bind to certain molecules. They lower the uh, energy needed to start this reaction. So you can kind of see that this enzyme is very specific to this substrate that links into it. And in this case, it's going to break a bond and make two new products. So that's what enzymes do. They just, they're very specific as to what molecules they bind to. They carry out that chemical reaction. They release the products and they move on. So I believe last year in biology, we did the liver lab. Actually, I remember that because the lab was extremely cold and everyone was just as, um, basically all in their winter coats, but. So enzyme catalyst, function number one. Moving on to function number two, defense. So sometimes proteins recognize microbes or bad things inside of you. Sometimes they recognize cancer cells and get rid of it, um, venom, is a protein. So how venom usually works is, here's the venom, okay? It's made up of, in this case, a chlorotoxin protein, and they bind to specific receptors outside the cell, which means they might block channels or ions, and then the cell can't get the materials it needs, and then the cell slowly dies. So that's how venom works. It binds to certain receptors, um, like snake venom, some snake venoms, they um, block up neurosynapses. So remember if, um, maybe, I don't know if we got to nervous system in biology or not, but I, so we have, this is a dendrite, a neuron, if you will. Here's the nucleus. So it picks up a signal and it sends it down the axon to the end. And then at the other end, it meets up with another neuron, right? So if I zoom in on this area, um, I would see something like this. Mm -hmm. 
so it releases neurotransmitters that cross a gap because they don't they don't actually touch. There's a small little space between this neuron and this other neuron, so it transmits the signal electrically, and then it jumps to chemical, and then it jumps back to an electrical signal. So it releases neurotransmitters, and they travel across. But if this is the other end, and venom has bonded to it and literally blocked it, it means neurotransmitters can't get across, and so the neurons all talk to each other. So venom, like, people start to get lethargic, they just don't move, and then pretty soon they stop breathing, and their heart stops, and they die. That's how venom works, usually. Okay. Another function, transport. So they transport molecules and ions, I can just say transport. But a great example, the hemoglobin, your red blood cells, protein, carries oxygen and blood. Um, myoglobin, oxygen in the muscle, transferrin, carries iron and blood. So just some great examples of proteins carrying things inside of our circulatory system. So this next slide is going to look at snakes and the toxins and venoms that they produce. I think it just tells you the effects they have on an organism. Because I could, it's a big picture, so I couldn't fit it on this slide. So even in the salivary gland um, of snakes, there are there's venom. Um, but here it tells you the snake toxin and the effects. So um, the big one here is acetylcholine esterase, disruption of the nerve impulses causing heart and respiratory failure. We also have some that do tissue decay, some that lower your blood pressure. Here's an anaphylactic shock, paralysis of smooth muscle. Um, so like your esophagus doesn't work, um, your intestines, they start to slow down. So yeah, snake, snake venom has a lot of different toxins in it. So. Are they like removing they give you they give you um it's, it's usually a shot and it it literally just pries out the cork that's blocking those receptors basically or eats it and degrades it the the venom gets dissolved by the vaccine i don't i don't think they call it a vaccine though they call it something else Antitoxin, that might be it. I feel like it's a different term. An antidote. I think that's what it's called. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. So, like, I'm sure in the movies you see, like, oh my gosh, I got bit by a snake, and they're like, suck the poison out, right? Yes, same movie. No, like I don't know either, but I think the, the whole purpose. But the purpose is like if you can get it quickly, then it like slows the it transport. Down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fourth function is support. So protein that can form some pretty tough fibers like keratin found in hair and nails, fibrin and blood clots. We have protein collagen in our skin, ligaments, tendons, and bones. Collagen is the most abundant protein in our body. Yep. Take the protein. Um, no idea. I just know it does affect it. 
honestly, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know anybody in my family that has. So I just like have never like pursued, looked into it. So. Say it one more time. Yep. Yep. Okay, fifth function is motion. So muscles are made of protein filaments, myosin and actin. So pretty important job there. Proteins that cling on to each other. We'll talk about how muscles contract second semester. But they shorten. So when your muscles contract, these little crosshair fibers will latch onto these fibers and literally crawl up. So when they crawl up, it pushes it this way. And then the same for this side, where it pushes it this way, so your muscles contract. And then when they let go, they release. So like when you flex. Yeah, when you flex. Okay. Well, we'll pick it up here. Slide 80 out of 133. I have a question. Sure. Um, I can you go back to where we were talking about 